Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan and today we're coming at you with the midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. There's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. Think of it like a time capsule. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the U.S. industry, identify top U.S. MSOs that you keep seeing pop up that you think will be worth more in the future than they are now, and take advantage whenever you feel ready, if you wish to do so, of course, pending whatever incremental reform we get from now until the end of the year. But good news out of states, as Baltimore relays nearly $21 million in cannabis sold during Maryland's first week of legalization. Huge. Couldn't have expected a better rollout for them. And so this is 20.9 in the first week after 10.4 million made in the opening weekend. And so while I recently covered this, just going to share some spots here if you wanted to pause to read. But main thing to highlight, Harvey said he's seen consistent foot traffic and a sharp 5 to 10 fold increase in the number of daily transactions in the first week of rec sales compared to the first month his shop opened in October, selling only to medical cannabis customers. And so big congrats to every entrepreneur and operator in the state of Maryland that is providing access to a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative, because no doubt they are seeing the benefits of ending cannabis prohibition and they are very happy to see the jobs the tax revenue and all this money flow in legally to their state and so you can pause to read but the maryland cannabis administration anticipates the industry will reap about 600 million in retail sales in the first year and at a current nine percent tax rate that'll be about 54 million coming back in to be redistributed hopefully properly uh, and to benefit all the citizens in the state and with that uh, marijuana moment reports that maryland announces a 40 million dollar program uh, to help cannabis social equity businesses open up shop and i would just say we know what social equity is, equal outcomes for all that think they're getting equal access to opportunity. So I would just say good luck. Maryland seems to be off to a good start already. They don't necessarily need this, but it will appeal to the Dems and the uh, easily fooled voter bases. And so you can pause to read here. Otherwise, you can grab the full link in the description to go through that. But happy to share some other news out of states as Christopher Norman shares two more New Jersey cannabis dispensaries since July 1st, making just 35 adult use dispensaries. Imagine if they opened 100 or a few hundred to legally supply the demand properly. Um, but as of right now, it's just 35 with 14 medical only. For a measly 49 statewide dispensaries, roughly 15 months after launching for adult use. You cannot make this shit up. It's almost like the regulators are encouraging the black market to stay in business. I don't get it, especially when you look at Maryland, which has 101 adult use dispensaries open since July 1st, because part of their program launch was that all existing medical dispensaries would be converted to sell adult use. Why wouldn't New Jersey want to do that? I don't know, but clearly Maryland is seeing the benefits and loving it. And so out of NewJersey.com, another hilarious one just to show the virtue signaling dozens of legal weed stores to open in New Jersey soon, and all they say is New Jersey will soon add to the already 34 legal adult use dispensaries dotting the state, but cannabis industry buzzing ahead of July 20th networking event. If only regulators in New Jersey cared as much about opening new dispensaries to legally supply the demand and phase out the black market as they cared about fleecing their citizens for these networking events and wasting more money and time virtue signaling. It's just, it's preposterous. And so you can pause to read here, but all they do is jump into this event coming up and how it's going to cost 125 per ticket. And just imagine, if you've been excluded from the industry this long and they want you to pay more money to go to this, like, man, it just must suck trying to be a social equity entrepreneur on the East Coast at this moment. Well, this one out of Massachusetts is cannabis sales hit record high in June. This was completely unexpected, but we will take it. So for a bit more detail, just to scroll down, as rec sales in the state reached 132.8 million, while medical hits 19 million. So the combined 151.8 million is the highest amount of monthly total sales in Massachusetts since adult use cannabis retail stores opened in November of 2018. Again, unexpected. I don't exactly know why this is. If anyone is in Massachusetts and knows more, please let me know in the comments. But great stat to have uh, roll in is gross sales in the state since November 2018 have now reached 4.74 billion, uh, the commission said. And so good job, Massachusetts. Hopefully you can focus more on equal access to opportunity as opposed to social equity um, and keep these numbers going in the right direction. While out of Connecticut, as cannabis sales reached new high of 24 million in June for total of 122 million in first six months of of recreational sales and so again good job Connecticut continue doing what you're doing and again try to expand uh, the number of dispensaries that will always go a long way but as we can see, six months into the launch, 24 million in combined med and rec sales in June, a record monthly high, as June also marked the second month in a row where adult use sales, 12.5 million, exceeded medical cannabis purchases, 11.3 million, while people purchased 313 
1,510 products of rec cannabis during this month compared to 303,293. This isn't a bad thing as cannabis in itself is a medicine and like any substance, moderation is always key, but this highlights that those in Connecticut, much like Americans across the country, want to vote for legal cannabis with their dollars if given the opportunity as sales continue to head up in the right direction. So a bit more here if you wanted to pause uh, the breakdown of sales from Connecticut. And while there are some quotes, I'll scroll slowly if you want to pause to read, otherwise I'll leave it here. Pause to read or grab the full link in the description. But with that from MJ Biz Daily, as Arkansas, a small medical program, uh, seeing sales eclipse 141 million in first half of 2023, which represents a 5% increase from the same period last year. So good job, Arkansas, seeing a little bit of growth there as Department of Finance and Administration reports. And so MMJ dispensaries sold 29,000 pounds of cannabis, which is already up 23% year over year, while sales and product volume seem to be increasing while prices are possibly going down for the consumers, which is good for them. Um, but all of this noting that they will likely surpass the 276 million that they did last year, selling 50,547 pounds. And this all with just 94,373 active card holders. And so good job, Arkansas, providing access to a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative for those in your state. Well, an update out of Ohio. Thank you, Jesse Redmond, for sharing this and making it easy as the Coalition to Regulate Cannabis Like Alcohol submitted 222,198 signatures of Ohio voters from all 88 counties to the Ohio Secretary of State Wednesday, exceeding the requirements for the issue to appear on the November 7, 2023 election ballot. And so I will update you once there is a confirmation that this will be on the ballot, but it seems like Ohioans have put in the work. Is a politician going to get in the way of democracy again? And just to show you, these are MSOs with Ohio stores, so many MSOs would benefit from this uh, from Ohio, obviously, switching over and launching adult use as well. While from MJ Biz Daily, New Hampshire allowing out-of-state visitors and Canadians to buy medical cannabis. Interesting. Uh, as of June 28th, tourists and other visitors can buy from one of the state's seven, only seven, alternative treatment centers up to three times per year, according to New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. And so people who have at least one qualifying condition recognized in New Hampshire can buy MMJ in the state, limited to two ounces within a 10-day period. And so very interesting. A uh, full link in the description, obviously, or otherwise, but this covers the whole story, essentially. Um, and so on to the news that we got regarding safe banking and what Schmuck is going to be doing from the Dales report. In a new communique dated July 9th, Schmuck sooner, uh, <laughs> it seems the Dales report's got jokes too, explicitly mentions cannabis banking as part of key policy issues it is seeking to advance in the upcoming work period. Fair enough. Let's see if action matches rhetoric this time. It hasn't for the last two and a half years, but obviously if you don't solve the problem, it gets exacerbated and requires a solution. And so I'll put the link in the description, but you can pause to read. Main thing to highlight though is Senate Democrats will also continue our work with our Republican colleagues to advance legislation in a range of policy areas. And then he lists all these different policy areas, which includes safeguard cannabis banking, and more. Passing these bills will not be easy and we will depend on cooperation of our Republican colleagues to get any of them done. And so at least if you read this, it doesn't say that passing cannabis banking will not be easy. It says all of this will not be easy, but it sets the stage for Schmuck to continue to do what he's doing and sort of just blame it on the GOP for not being able to get it. And let's hope that's not the case, but this comes off of an article that was featured in Marijuana Moment that had a very clickbaity headline saying that Schmuck says passing safe banking will not be easy when clearly you can read that last bit and it's not just safe banking, it's everything that he says will not be easy. But just wanted to highlight this from that article as MJ Stock Trader shares, some bears seem to be ignoring the last part of the comment. Because if you read past the clickbaity headlines and the misleading reporting from Marijuana Moment, there was this little nugget at the end. As Schmuck said in a letter to colleagues that notably omitted his typical call for attaching criminal justice provisions like expungements. And what we know is that SAFE standalone has the votes to pass. From my understanding, according to Don Murphy, SAFE plus HOPE will also have what's needed to pass, but that is the most the GOP will allow. And essentially HOPE is added in order to get all the Dems on board, but anything more than safe plus hope is a no-go and it would make all of this dead in the water. It'd be what Schmuck has done for the last two and a half years, but it'd allow him to blame it on the GOP for lack of progress, which we know is not the case. Um, but all we can really do at this point in time is wait to see if he leaves the same out of future releases or if we see a change in language such as try, hope, would like to, and if that switches to I will, because Schmuck, you have the power. Can you please work for the American people and the cannabis industry for once? And with that from Gondrepreneur, just happy to report that amendments to loosen military's cannabis rules and to allow the VA to recommend cannabis to veterans has been added to the must-pass National Defense Bill. And so I'm very happy to see that this has been added in. However, while we've seen SAFE added into the NDAA and pulled out again by Schmuck in the last two years, it would be sad to see this pulled out. However, since the progress has been made, it would be great if this would go on board to recruit better quality people into the military and to allow veterans the access to a safe or non-addictive medicinal alternative that they've been calling for for the last like 50 years. It's not too much to ask. And so with that, just wanted to share from DMBC as this is a good observation. 
second time in two days. Marijuana Moment are taking comments about a broad range of legislation and trying to drive clicks by tricking people into thinking the comments are about just safe banking. Low integrity journalism, to be honest, and it's making me dislike them and want to use them less and less as a source. But just to highlight, obviously some comments seem to agree the same thing. But GOP Senator says Schumer's plan to pass cannabis banking bill this summer is wishful thinking. I don't think the majority leader actually believes we're going to produce legislation in these areas. And so if you actually go to the story, this is the very misleading title for Marijuana Moment. And I'm not sure if Kyle Yeager or Tom Engel wrote it, but it's very disappointing, guys, if you're twisting the truth for clicks. It's not journalism anymore. So just to show you, Senator John Cornyn, a Republican out of Texas, said this. Senator Schumer mentioned his desire to move forward on bills relating to drug pricing, fentanyl, permitting reform, rail safety, cannabis banking, China competition, artificial intelligence, and a number of other topics in the next three weeks. So to all of that, he said, maybe you would call this a wish list, the senator said, but it is only wishful thinking to believe that in the U.S. Senate, we are going to, or you are going to be able to get all of the necessary items addressed in the next 10 working days. Isn't that a sign of the Dems, right? Saying that they're going to get a lot done while getting zero done. We've seen that over the last two and a half years. So hopefully that's not the case this time around, but we wouldn't be surprised. So plan accordingly for your own situation. And so for the latest update we got as of yesterday, July 11th at 6.41 p.m., thank you, Brendan Pedersen, who writes for Punchbowl for sharing this. According to Telephone Tuesday, Sherrod Brown told Politico he's waiting on say, Steve Daines to secure GOP support before moving ahead on safe banking. And I don't know about you, but at this point, I trust Steve Daines almost more than anybody. Um, and he's been very vocal about cannabis, and so we believe he's for it. Daines told us the ball didn't move over July break and issues remain. And so while this conflicts with what we've heard from Don Murphy, what do you think? Do you think this is just a bit more political theater to keep us guessing? Or do you think this is actually the case and they're just going to find other priorities to put in the way of cannabis and kick the cannabis tent? can kick the cannabis can down the road like they've done for the last two and a half years. Wouldn't be surprising, but just wanted to show you what uh, context they also provided. And so while we were hoping for some big news yesterday when the Senate came back in from their recess, didn't really get anything. Uh, just more uh, unfortunate, annoying headlines like this that would lead us to believe we're going to get more of the same down the line. And so we could, uh, but with that, just wanted to share this one from The Undefined Mystic as it sort of summarizes what we're waiting on, not just the Safe Banking Act, as if you don't solve the problem for the last two and a half years, the problem gets worse and you need to eventually address it. But then the big mama rescheduling next, not at all well known, but Biden admin has a deadline of December 2nd to decide on rescheduling and the most informed sources and rhetoric from the Biden admin has never been more bullish. And so just wanted to share this because apparently this is also the case. And while they called on the scheduling review last year from HHS and DOJ, apparently in the guidelines, no later than one year after the date of enactment of this act, they need to respond with uh, whatever their determination is. And so figured I would share that. You can pause to read, but to scroll down, uh, essentially down here, great comment from Pawchalk. Only issue I see is with that deadline that there's no penalty if they don't do it. Wouldn't be surprising, but I'm like others and think it's done already, which I do believe as well, just waiting for political timing. It's likely sitting in the desk, much like we've seen Jason Wilde, executive chairman of terrorists, and say in the past, near-term hope is that SAFE gets marked up and voted out of committee before August recess. Uh, Biden needs a big win for the base, especially after student debt got knocked down. And so I do agree, um, but ultimately we're just going to have to wait and see what does end up happening. And so with that, just a reminder from Semi-Evolved Mammal, thank you for all the work you've done, Semi-Evolved Mammal, but folks, if you can, good morning, Reform supporters. His first call on his calendar, Chuck Schumer, to let his intern know that I strongly support SAFE banking for cannabis. So please consider if you are in the States, not even in New York, but use a New York State zip code, uh, call and give your support as to why it needs to pass. It'll make America safer getting cash off the streets, seeing less people die as these dispensaries are no longer targets for armed robberies. It'll stop discriminating against the industry. It'll help normalize the industry and get them in the banking system. Lots of points that you can make. And so the numbers right there, please consider reaching out if you can. So on to some MSO news, Canisewers.io, thank you for sharing this one as truly is opening its fourth Georgia dispensary in Pooler tomorrow as of July 12th. And so good to see Georgia, uh, sorry, truly expanding in lesser competitive states like Georgia, planning on opening their fifth dispensary soon uh, for Columbus, Georgia. So good to see them continuing to keep their head down and focus on executing. While well, Cureleaf to report second quarter 2023 financial and operational results after market close on August 9th. And I believe that's the day after Green Thumb, which will be August 8th. They may be August 10th. I don't exactly remember offhand, but good to see a second MSO ready to report less than a month away from now. Um, and with that, there was an interview that the Dales Report did, All Things Terrasend. I have not listened to it yet, and I'm not a shareholder in Terrasend, so I wasn't really going to planning on listening to it. I might listen to it a bit later, but for anyone interested, um, definitely you can check this out, especially if you are interested in Terrasend out of any other MSO. Link will be in the description to go through it. Um, and with that from Green Market Report, as cannabis companies are quietly downsizing. Well, this may be true. It's better to ask why, because is a sad reality, no more consequence of Congress, state politicians and state regulators, except for maybe Missouri and Michigan, 
doing everything in their power to work against these cannabis companies as opposed to trying to help them thrive in their states in the name of social equity. And so when you consider that all of these companies are operating with both hands tied behind their backs and they've only gone from 428,059 jobs in 2022 down to 417,493 jobs as of February 2023, I'd say that they're doing all right. Because if they would have gotten 280E removed a few years ago, like they would have needed, they would have, many of them would have been more profitable by now, especially the tier ones. If they had gotten safe a few years ago, like the industry needed, they'd be light years ahead. And if state regulators realized that opening more legal outlets to sell legal cannabis so Americans can vote with their dollars would offset the black market and give less power to organized crime groups, right? You'd think the numbers would be heading in the right direction. And I know we cannot invest based off of what ought to have happened. We can only invest based off of what happened. Now, I invested based off of what ought to have happened. But for anyone who's coming in that has never invested any money, the fact is that these MSOs are making more money and closer to profitability than ever before, while 280E might be removed in the next, say, 6 to 12 months. Yet their valuations are, you know, as low as they've ever been just up from the bottom. And so I don't know what else, but that screams opportunity to me. But again, just my opinion, not advice. Uh, plan accordingly for your own situation. So there's a bit more down here for their silver lining, but just wanted to try and give my two cents based on, you know, the reality of what is going on behind that. And so three U.S. cannabis stocks picks from Beacon Securities. This one comes from Cantech Letter. Again, take this with a grain of salt, just sharing it um, as it features Air Wellness, Cure Leaf, and Verano for anyone interested in learning a bit more about those MSOs. And so I won't spend too much time on it, but I'm just going to bring you down to Cure Leaf, which is the first one that they feature uh, with a buy rating price target of 850 Canadian. A bit more info down here on Cure Leaf, while Verano, a bit more here if you wanted to pause to read, buy in a price target of 17 Canadian, and then Air Wellness buy with a price target of 12 Canadian, um, and full article in the description if you wanted to go through that. And so onto some studies, as SciTech Daily shares more than pain relief, sustained cannabis use leads to improved cognition in cancer patients. What do you know? As of July 8, 2023, um, new research indicates that cannabis may alleviate chemo brain fascinating. Calendar intuitive, but the data don't lie. And so I'm just going to leave this here if you wanted to pause to read. Otherwise, you can go through the whole link. But to highlight, survey suggests that as many as 40% of U.S. cancer patients use cannabis, uh, U.S. cancer patients or use cannabis, yet only a third of doctors feel comfortable advising them about it because doctors don't know the first thing about cannabis because they only spend about two hours in med school learning about the endocannabinoid system. And most of their incentive is towards pushing opioids and prescription medication. And so until that changes and until we educate doctors better, um, sadly, we're still going to see a lot of the same and the requirement for people to self-medicate with cannabis, which is okay. Um, but again, you can pause to read more, otherwise full link in the description, but there's a lot of studies to go through, so I'm going to spend too much time on one. Well, this is another one from ACS Publications um, as of July 4th, 2023, so quite new. Antiviral activity of cannabidolic acid and its methyl ester against SARS-CoV-2. And I remember the main reason I stopped posting on TikTok and Instagram was when I tried to share some studies that found that uh, cannabis or CBD could be um, an effective uh, preventative uh, medicine towards that. Um, unfortunately, I just got my account banned by those uh, ridiculous um, tech platforms. And so, hence why I don't use them anymore. All this to highlight, though, the results showed that CBDA methyl ester can be considered as a lead compound to be further developed as a new effective drug against these sort of infections. You can't make this shit up, right? If only this wasn't suppressed by the mainstream media, you'd think this news was, would be blasted on mainstream media outlets everywhere. But if you've learned to trust your eyeballs over what you've been told over the last few years, as you very well should have, congrats to you, as you can now clearly see that politicians only care about controlling the narrative and pushing whatever agendas their lobbyists want them to push, as opposed to actually working in the best interest of the public health, because then cannabis would have been descheduled 50 years ago, or it never would have been put in the CSA in the first place. It's almost as if these politicians forget that they work for the American people, and it's not the American people that need them, not at all. And so onto this one from Clinical Therapeutics. I found this interesting from June 2023. Um, nine insights from 10 years of legal cannabis for non-medical purposes. And I'll admit, I only read the abstract. I didn't need to go through the whole thing, but I just read through this part and was like, how lousy of a report is this? If you can think of nine things that were beneficial and not include the amount of jobs that it provides to states that need jobs, uh, especially as everything's been outsourced from the U.S. over the last two decades, uh, it does not provide tax revenue or how that tax revenue has gone back into certain states and certain programs and how that has helped people in those states, let alone how legalizing cannabis for medical or even adult use leads to a 25% reduction in opioid overdoses, especially when over 100,000 Americans died from opioids last year. You cannot make this shit up, and I'm not going to spend too much time going through them. I invite you to read it, but it'll just piss you off as you go through and you're like, is this all that they could come up with based on all the data that's out there? And apparently it is. And so obviously there's a lot more beneficial things that they did not include in here, but I want to stick to the science just to point out what we know and what they seem to uh, want to forget or omit. 
Legalizing cannabis decreases fatal opioid overdoses, study shows. An older one from January 19th, 2023, but just to prove my point, getting down to the numbers, um, in 2010 alone, states with legalized medical cannabis saw approximately 1,700 fewer opioid-related overdose deaths. We found there was about a 25% lower rate of prescription painkiller overdose deaths on average after implementation of medical cannabis law. Fair enough. And that's medical, but we're even seeing it in legalizing just outright. And so another one, uh, injury epidemiology, state cannabis laws and opioid overdose mortality, background method results you can pause to read. And this one is from 2019, September 22. But main thing to highlight the findings, legalizing cannabis for rec use was associated with an additional 7% reduction in opioid overdose mortality in Colorado and a 6% reduction in opioid prescriptions among fee-for-service Medicaid and managed care enrollees. Well, this review focused on recreational cannabis as opposed to medical. I don't know if the 7% reduction and the 6% reduction is on top of an already existing reduction that states that have legalized for medical first might have seen, and then they see a bit of an extra on top after legalizing for adult use. I don't know, but the numbers speak for itself, and if it's saving lives, it might as well be instituted or at least acknowledged as opposed to keeping the status quo alive. And then I invite you to read the conclusion. The top two sentences are just going to piss you off because the tone is completely against what they find in the review. But last bit, it, remind, it remains unclear whether the presumed benefit of legalizing cannabis in reducing opioid-related harms outweighs the policy's, policy's externalities, such as its impact on mental health, which if you saw my Sunday video, turns out that mental health is actually better in states where cannabis is legal as opposed to not. And so new data has proved that wrong. And traffic safety, another propagandist talking point that has been proven wrong from data in Colorado, Washington State, and Canada as well. And so at least I'll give these uh, researchers the benefit of the doubt because it's an older study from 2019. But just to give you an example, another one from Science Daily from 2019, cannabis legalization reduces opioid deaths. And so the study examined how the changing legal status of cannabis has impacted mortality in the U.S. over the past two decades. Investigators found that legalizing and access to recreational cannabis, not even just medical, reduced annual opioid mortality in the range of 20 to 35 percent with particularly pronounced effects for synthetic opioids. And so, again, just highlighting that if politicians were pro-life as opposed to pro-death, which many of them seem to be pro-death for whatever reason, you'd want to change the status quo and save American lives. Uh, and this one actually came across my page, I think, as of today, the potential paradoxical neurocognitive effects of cannabis use in patients with psychotic disorders, a critical meta-review of meta-analytical evidence published May 30th, 2023. You can read the background methods, but to get these results, findings showed better neurocognitive performance in cannabis using patients for planning, reasoning, and working memory. Again, counterintuitive, but the data doesn't lie. There were tendencies towards significance for processing speed and attention. Most effect sizes showed small to moderate degrees of outperformances in cannabis users. However, individuals with lifetime use appeared to show better neurocognitive functions. Who would have thought? And so we need more studies like this. And I imagine we'll get a lot more than once we finally deschedule cannabis. And we're waiting for some sort of a rescheduling or descheduling answer by December 2nd. So keep your head up, folks. And with that from Peter Grinspoon, another one just to show exactly why it is so useful to transition older patients onto cannabis for whatever drug they are fatally overdosing on. Um, because 20-year trends in drug overdose fatalities among older adults in the U.S., it's not heading in the right direction. And at this point, we have too much compelling data proving that medical cannabis is far safer, which is why so many older Americans are transitioning. We just need more doctors educated on cannabis and the endocannabinoid system to help the shift, but no doubt descheduling and helping normalize it would be the biggest push. Um, and we're almost there, folks. And so this one is study or a review from the future, September 2023, under the umbrella of depression and Alzheimer's disease physiopathology. Can cannabinoids be a dual pleiotropic therapy? Yeah, no shit. Hence why the US government has had patents on cannabinoids for the last 20 some years, but we'll get to that in the next story. And so I'm just going to read the highlights and then I'll scroll down and invite you to pause to read the abstract if you're interested. But depression is apparently a risk factor to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Several common physiopathological mechanisms are impaired in depression and Alzheimer's disease. While the endocannabinoid system, which is existent in every human being and every mammal from my understanding, and only gets about two hours of focus during a doctor's entire time in medical school, which is mind boggling, is dysregulated in depression and Alzheimer's disease. Huh, you don't say. And apparently cannabinoids have potential to modulate the physiopathological mechanisms common in both disease. So are you saying that depression and Alzheimer's disease could possibly be caused by an endocannabinoid system that is no longer producing 
you know, cannabinoids within itself, hence why cannabis could be a substitute. I don't know, just thinking out loud, but I'm going to bring you down here if you wanted to pause to read and just leave you with that, folks. But on to the remaining stories. Uh, Xavier Haas, who writes for uh, Benzinga, uh, was at a recent conference, and cannabis has been an efficacious medication utilized by civilizations all over the world for the last 5,000 years. And one of your favorite daytime TV hosts, Montel Williams, uh, at a Benzinga conference, shares his two cents about cannabis. So, so folks who are a little thank bit you, Montel. to take that next step and, speaking and, the and truth. explore that as a possible treatment, what do you say to them? You know, I mean, one of the things that, that I think most people who are kind of curious, they are still curious and haven't taken that leap because they're, they have had it beaten into their brain, the crap that they've been taught about cannabis. Propaganda works. For the last, say, 60 years. But the truth of the matter is, cannabis has been an efficacious medication utilized by civilizations all over the world for less than 5,000 years. Facts. And if you don't even want to believe in its history, just believe in the fact that the group that you give charter over you, called the U.S. government, that gives charter over the FDA, is a group that filed for a patent on cannabis almost 22 years ago. Mattel gets it. Understanding how efficacious a medication it is. So believe your government and demand that you get access to what they think is the Right? Just, again, points out whether you know the truth and you're willing to acknowledge it or people that just want to live stuck in the past propaganda. And sadly, we round off this episode with the remaining states that still don't get it and choosing to rob their citizens of their own freedom of choice as top North Carolina GOP lawmaker says he's very sure medical cannabis bill won't advance this session. Why? Is it your fault, sir? How un-American, right? Said legislatures would likely return to this issue during next year's short session. Let's hope they do. Full link in the description if you want to go through that or if you're from North Carolina. I'd be crying like MJ down here as well. With that, even from Alabama, as apparently the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission voted to delay the awarding of medical cannabis business licenses until an auditor reviews how applications were initially scored. Why you gotta go the social equity approach and fuck this whole thing up, Alabama? Equal access to opportunity. It's not hard. And so good comment down here from BB Bear. It's almost like capping licenses causes more headaches than a free market approach. Good job. Yeah, what do you know? Been trying to say this for the last two years. Hopefully people are paying attention and catching on. Uh, but full link in the description if you wanted to go through that. Well, this last one from MJ Biz Daily essentially just highlights we don't want a legal market. We don't want anything good for the economy. We want the black market to run rampant. That's what this means. Is Virginia's governor not interested in legalizing adult use cannabis sales? Although they decriminalized last year, and so fortunately you can home grow and you're not going to go to jail for having cannabis. But if you're not going to launch a legal adult use market to offset the black market, you're just inviting organized crime into Virginia. And get this, according to the Charlottesville newspaper, The Daily Progress, the Republican has stated that he is not interested in any further moves towards legalization of adult recreational use cannabis. Fair enough, but why? Could you give a reason? Asked by The Progress... For clarification, a spokesperson for the governor said, as it stands, retail cannabis sales in Virginia are illegal and it would require legislative action for that change. So it means I would have to do some work and I don't feel like doing any work at the moment. You cannot make this shit up. And while I don't really play sides anymore, left and right, it doesn't matter. It's ultimately the elite trying to rob all of us. So we all have got to band together and realize we have way more in common and we have to at least hold those at the top accountable. Uh, it's just... RIP to what could have been a very successful uh, adult use program in Virginia. And so with that last story, apparently there's a new film com coming out called The Last Deal. And I'll admit I was happy last year to share when Billions, the TV show, mentioned the Safe Banking Act in it. It's like, oh my God, when a TV show mentions something real that's happening, leading us to believe Safe would actually pass. Well, it's not the first time and it's not our first rodeo, but apparently Safe Banking is in the news and it is part of the story behind the last deal film. What do you think? Could this be some foreshadowing that we finally get the common sense legislation that the industry is needed to give them that breath of fresh air? Or is it just going to be more of the same? I'll talk from the Dems with no action. Please let me know what you think in the comments, but a short clip below. Watch this year's hit indie crime thriller on Amazon or your favorite platform. Bobby collected whatever little debt was owed. See, that's bullshit, dude. That's why we need safe banking. Growers, dispensaries, you can't get any kind of bank accounts, no loans. It's bullshit. Blatant discrimination. I'm gonna go talk to him. Talk to him? Yeah. The guy. And what? Tell him you can't pay him? No, no. If he's a businessman, he's gonna want to work something out. Yeah, or break your legs. And that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.